thank you so much for joining us today to talk about you know climate security and national security here in our state of Arizona. Um, my name is Quinn Gauss. I'm a climate security adjunct fellow with the American Security Project. Um, I'm a recent graduate of ASU Law, a couple blocks down the street, um, and I'm really excited to be here and serve as your moderator today for the panel. Um, just by way of brief introduction um, to ASB and then also to our panelists before we get started. Um, the American, excuse me, the American Security Project is a bipartisan, uh, nonpartisan, DC-based policy research facility, um, and we're we're really focused on um, national security and sort of the way that that sort of leads into sort of other policy areas. Um, specific to to this event, we're um, we're sort of our flagship is the National uh, Climate Security Tour. Um, and so we kind of will do some regional focuses on several different sort of climate um, climate issues that vary state to state. Um, so that's what brings us here today to Arizona, um, my home state, uh, to talk about you know some issues and some sort of exciting developments um, in, in this place that I grew up and care about. Um, so um, without further ado, this is Autumn, Autumn Johnson. Um, she's the executive director of the um, Arizona Solar Energies Association, um, Energy Industry Association. Um, <laughs> it's an asshole. No, don't worry. It is not. I get it wrong kind of a lot. I'm sure. <laughs> um, and then this is, this is Mark Hartman. He's the Chief Sustainability Officer at the City of Phoenix. Um, and then last at the end, uh, uh, this is Lieutenant General Romsey. Uh, he is um, the American Security Project's uh, President. Um, and he's flown all the way here from DC today to talk to us um, about uh, national security and climate security and sort of the way those two sort of are. Are, are married here in um, here in Arizona. So um, we've got kind of a lot to go over. So um, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, I, I would like to start with um, with you, um, Norm. Um, just sort of to, to start us out in national security. Um, you have extensive experience, um, sort of tactical, tactical and sort of operational sort of um, you know ventures with. Uh, with the military, um, I think that one of the ways that sort of the national security enterprise talks about um, climate um, is, is characterizing it as a threat multiplier. Um, could you just speak a little bit about what that um, you know what that means and sort of um, the way that you way that you view it? Great, it's great to be back in Arizona. I almost feel like I'm a resident because I've done enough training at Blue Air Force Base. Been on the range here, my. That's the sign of who's down in uh, Tucson and 12th Air Force Air. So it's great to be in the hot, dry weather. I just left the hot, steamy weather in DC, and it's great to be on the Beltway and back around people that have common sense by what's going on in, uh, in Washington, DC. So let me start off by asking the group here uh, how many people are familiar with the term threat multiplier? Okay, next question. <laughs> well, it's an important phrase. And uh, it came about again in 2007. Prior to 2007, we kind of looked at climate change as a environmental as environmental issues, very siloed type of discussions, very academic. Uh, and uh, a gal named uh, Sherry Goodman, who started the Center for Naval Analysis, brought together 11 retired four-star generals and admirals who had been involved in uh, environmental planning and risk during your career. And she said, hey, you know, we need to broaden this discussion. Uh, we need to bring more people into it. We need to uh, be able to talk it uh, in a non-quote academic way. And so they uh, did some research for about a year, then put out a paper that basically said, hey, climate change is it's more than just an environmental thing. It's a, it's a threat multiplier. It's an accelerant. It's, it's, it exasperates existing conditions there. Uh, and more importantly, it brings risks and it brings impacts to our security. And not just our, our own national security, but our, our economic security, our climate security, our environmental security. And it brings security risks around the world that we as, and whether we like it or not, we're the world's policemen. We respond to all those type of uh, events that go on. So that's kind of the emphasis of it. If you Google, go to Google Scholar, you'll find that there's over 75,000 citations that use the term threat multiplier. So talk about going from a very stovepipe type of discussions to everyone in the brother is using that. I mean, it allows us to have a, a 
bipartisan type of discussion without people running to the corners and crossing their arms and, uh, and just staring at each other. What you see now today is when you see an article on, the, on threat multipliers, you'll also see words like central threat, main threat, where people are saying, hey, we need to just look away from this, not look away, but we need to expand even more, not just look at national security, but look at what we're going to do as not just a whole of government, but a whole of nation. When we start talking about whole of nation, that means everyone in our country needs to be involved in what we're trying to do now is take that glide slope of the temperatures and at least level it off and hopefully point it down again. Because it can't be done by one person. There's not a silver bullet out there that the Department of Defense or the Energy uh, Cabinet can take care of there. It's kind of a all hands on deck. It's a uh, not a spectator sport, it's a full contact sport. Uh, and probably my fear is before I give up the stage here the discussion is that uh, we're going to put ourselves in the corners like we do now and stop having conversations where we have uh, civil discourse. And instead of civil discourse, we just have loud echo chamber type of discussions that doesn't get anywhere. So we hope as an American security body, we can educate and inform people and do it in a very civil manner. That's one of our purposes of moving around the country, uh, being sponsored by the, by the ADF and others. So I'll leave that to that. I'm happy to entertain any questions later on about the spread multiplier, it's accelerating this whole idea about uh, uh, exasperation of uh, ongoing threats and uh, species. So, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it's sort of in contrast to, to sort of the approach of the American military that you were just kind of touching on. Um, Mr. Hartman, I know that you have some experience, you know, sort of in, in other, you know, with our neighbors to the north in Canada, um, working on some sort of sustainability related issues there. And I wondered if you could maybe speak to the difference that you've experienced, you know, um, both in terms of, you know, addressing the kind of risks there. I'm, I'm sure they're in contrast with things, but just maybe sort of structurally, you know, um, from a government perspective. The way that your experience in Canada contrasts uh, with the way that you address the sustainability issues. Well, certainly before I came, uh, the perception was, uh, you know, very different. You still see equal representation on the left and the right here. That's great. <laughs> so, you know, before I came, you know, a lot of people would say to me, "Oh my, you know, you're going. People shouldn't even live in the desert. Why would you even go? Why would you go work for a city where, you know, that's kind of the attitude?" And then, you know, coming here, it's like. Did you know that energy use per square foot is less in here than in cold climate cities because you know their air conditioning is more efficient than heating equipment and they're using less and more electricity, which can be a lot greener for buildings. And so they're using less energy than Portland and New York per square foot, like for, for our buildings. And and you know people here are very much desert adapted. So you would say who has bigger issues around water, for example? And you think oh for sure Phoenix has like absolutely and. That's, I wouldn't say so. That Vancouver, it's basically a rainforest. It rains there as much as the sun here. Um, but every summer, they have a regulations where you cannot sprinkle, you cannot wash your car, you cannot do any of those things during the summer. And if there was ever a low snowfall year in Vancouver, they'd have to be trucking anymore. Like, it's, they are exposed, or they're not climbing because everybody lives not living here as a desert. You're, Plants are visitor adapted, and so are people. But working on water policy for a long time, so having that security uh, underneath Phoenix is almost 300 years worth of water. Uh, so, um, yeah, we don't use the groundwater, we're actually 100% milk surface um, Even places like California, we cycle 4% of its water, Phoenix recycles all of its water. And so, really different way of thinking about things. Um, and certainly great opportunities for renewables here, particularly because we're primarily electricity. And uh, once we get our transportation sector solved with electric vehicles, it can also be electricity. It's a real opportunity for roads and transportation. So even though Vancouver gets, wow, Vancouver, you know, but there's actually it is some vulnerabilities. And I would say, I don't think globally any city is really exempt from the impacts and that uh, some may think they are, <laughs> but Really, there's exposure from you know increased rainfall and flooding and stuff. We've seen that all around the globe. That is okay. What area of is not issues around forest fires in Canada right now are just ridiculous. Like, 
I have three family members that are going to be evacuated from their homes for forest fires. So like, so who's more vulnerable? Okay, you know, hey. so I would say yes, there's differences in sort of perception, but I think we each have our own opportunities and challenges. And um, yeah, I think ultimately, I think it definitely we keep thinking about from you know threat multipliers. We think about it from every city and every every person. Not my question. I'm just jumping in here. Uh, it's just an interesting sort of perspective too for, for folks to say. Why would someone live in the desert? You know, there's no water. A lot of the world's population lives in the desert. Um, so it's just, and obviously, you know, if all those people were to move somewhere where they had water, like Canada, then you have additional refugee problems. So it just seems a little bit um, sort of short-sighted to assume that everybody lives in a, you know, in a water-rich uh, location and we can all just move in. So obviously, there are entire countries. Even, even heat, like for example, 4% of Vancouver is air conditioned. So I think 2020, we had a huge heat thing, and it's 4,500 people who died in the Pacific Northwest during that one month of June, uh, which is just, we don't have like heat deficit. Like we can talk about heat deficit here and stuff, but nothing like the Pacific Northwest. So there's certainly vulnerabilities that we've never seen. And it's, you know, I think, in, I think the perception comes from um, certainly Vancouver. Very like air conditioning is just like, oh, it's just like a rich house. So if everybody needs air conditioning, well, then you gotta treat them all like rich people. Like, it's like, just using all this surplus. Like, it's just a luxury. Um, when we live in Vancouver, my wife and I was screaming, when you turn the air conditioning on in the car, we're going to a wedding. You know? <laughs> um, so uh, it was those kind of things where you just kind of say, it's a luxury, it's a luxury. But then, uh, but, but really, when you look at what is the conditioning of the indoor environment, it's actually. We're using less energy to go to that. So it's just such a change in perception of everybody else versus ourselves that we don't see our own issues. Absolutely. I mean, and I think that, you know, you touched on like building resiliency and sort of that desert adaptation. You think about water and needing water. I think most recently, you know, whether it be advancements in technology or, um, you know, incentives to the Inflation Reduction Act, we're seeing sort of Arizona be put. Put on stage, I think, for for you know solar energy development and sort of pushing that you know pushing our reputation as a valid sun to like you know its its fullest extent. And so, Autumn, I was, I was kind of hoping that you would maybe speak a little bit to to any changes, any movement that you've seen here now. Like, I think one year annually passed the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, and like wanted to to understand the ways that maybe it's changed the landscape of your work, and you know if, if you're seeing uh, any you know, movements or well, whether they be positive or negative, but just changes to the way that your that your issues work. You know, Mark Mark reminds me this week that I should be more optimistic. I'm more, more, well, trying to be as optimistic as possible during this presentation. I've been a little bit heavy down in the last couple of weeks, so that that's probably not as entertaining. Um, yeah, so I you know, and I um, there's been some media lately of, of some policymakers in Arizona sort of pooing the IRA, and I and I, I think that's sort of misguided. Obviously, the IRA is the most significant legislation, you know, recently regarding the energy transition. Um, it you know extended the investment tax credit for an additional ten years. That sort of is really important for the industry. It added additional you know um, standalone uh, incentives for battery storage, which is really important. But I think that there's also sort of an idea that um, there's a, it's a panacea, right? The IRA passed, we're kind of all done here on the policy front, everything's good, and we can kind of move on. I think it's something that state advocates um, and folks that work you know, at, at, at le levels even smaller than that have been saying for a long time is that federal policy is important, it's not the only thing, right? What I like to tell people is, it's great if there's all these incentives to build everything, but if no local jurisdictions will do it, then it's not going to help us. So um, we have a lot of challenges at the state and local level in Arizona policy-wise when it comes to renewables. I'm actually giving a talk in a couple of weeks um, at, a, at a different a different venue, specifically focused on the fact that it doesn't really need to be a partisan issue. There, there's no reason that clean energy transition should be partisan. Um, there's something for everyone to like about clean energy. Um, whether it's the fact that we have, we are seeing a, a pretty significant increase in manufacturing um, in Arizona. There's announcements it seems like almost every day regarding electrification of transportation, um, panel manufacturing, battery manufacturing. 
I think one of the problems, um, besides lack of local sort of policy support for clean energy transition, is the fact that it's it's not really evenly divided amongst different segments of clean energy. So, um, manufacturing in Arizona is flourishing. Um, there's a lot of other folks that participate in the clean energy economy that are down or really struggling now. So I was just looking at um, some data today regarding solar installations in Arizona. And it's a plummet for 2023 from 2022 because of really high interest rates for residential solar, as well as some problematic issues with uh, uh, tariffs and, and utility and ACC, uh, Arizona Corporation Commission policy. So it's a mixed bag. Um, and so we are seeing improvements in some sectors of the economy, but I don't think that it means that we're, you know, everything is rosy for all aspects of the energy in the Arizona market. I guess the way to frame it in the market transformation curve, you start with incentives and then but when you get to a certain percent of the population, you need to move to regulation to get the remainder of the um, population. So it's, if we're not seeing that end of regulation, the incentives will mean an initial increase, but then we'll fade back down to where they were. And so that there will be continued incentives until there's regulation just to catch the kind of late comers. Um, but I uh, Maybe, maybe it's just because we're such a big recipient of the city of Phoenix. So far, we have over 400 million we've received uh, in grants from the IRA, and we'll probably be over a billion by the time it's done. We actually just applied for two billion in a water resilience grant. Uh, and so these are some pretty huge ones. And the climate pollution reduction grant is it's four and a half billion dollars, which we're going to apply for a lot of things around transportation and buildings and a lot of opportunities. So um, and then Autumn and I are working on the $250 million solar for all application for the state for solar for low income. So there is some really good ones that as it builds up the industry and, uh, you know, for example, in that one we're thinking of having one's buying down interest rates, all the seller will really help on that. So there is some real opportunity to hopefully just normalize some of the investment and build up the industry and support it. Such that I think if it's positioned as, you know, climate, all climate change is not about clean air, clean water, healthy systems, like it's like actually things that we do care about. We, you know, that people, yeah, everybody supports clean air, and so let's kind of focus on those things, not on uh, trying to get some of them to say, I'm not saying, oh, it's going to you know, something. <laughs> but, but, and it really, to me, and I've actually said this a lot on our, like, even our council, is that. Um, you know, carbon emissions are not the focus, that's just a symptom of something that's going on, and that, or at least in our society, just, you know, we're cutting down our trees globally every year, putting plastics into our water streams, we're putting, we're doing these things, and we just, we just eliminate the amount of waste, we are wasting buildings. The building code in Germany was a building code here, buildings in Asia use 80% less energy. Um, so it's those types of things, I think, that can really start the conversation and that people can see uh, see the results. And then I think it really, most people are against any change at all. If you see something you like, they go, okay, that's good, I'll go for that. So it's, I think a lot of it's just demonstrating to people what's possible. Absolutely. I just have one more. I think, you know, kind of think of it, oh, it's the one year anniversary, it's in August. And that's not that long of a time in policy land. And so um, we're still waiting on a lot of treasury guidance and a lot of sort of the trickle down dollars from the IRA, you know, haven't come to fruition yet. And so we're optimistic that that'll be the case in the future. I think Mark's been really lucky that they've seen so much money so early, but a lot of segments of the of the, of the industry are still kind of waiting for those benefits to trickle down to them. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I'm just to bring you into the discussion a little bit, something I was really fascinated about, but I've been sort of learning and thinking about this panel is that the davis Monthan Air Force Base, yeah, davis Monthan, they, they have a solar array um, that, that has, has been there now for, for quite some time, and I, I, wasn't, I wasn't aware, and so I guess in sort of um, un -part, walking back sort of the partisan, you know, conversation surrounding the clean energy transition and around climate change, um, could, you know, you maybe just speak to, you know, solar installations in the military and, and you know, ways that the military can sort of lead by, by example in being, um, you know, uh, clean energy sensitive. Or, or well, we definitely need to be part of the solution. Um, 
Department of Defense is the number one producer of power in the country. So we can't sit here and just go, hey, Phoenix, push it up and get more done. We need to be doing our, our share, and we are. Uh, as you mentioned, we've got a great solar capability down in uh, Tucson at the least one Air Force Base. There's a huge one up in Dallas. Uh, there's one over in Dickham. They're popping up out of uh, And we're using them primarily to be able to do micro -grids. We need to be able to project power, project our capabilities 24 uh, percent We need to make sure that our families are taken care of 24 percent We need to continue our training day in and day out. We have to fix our planes 24 percent We have to be ready to go forward when we don't deter our, our, our problems out there. We need to be able to you know, win our wars for our country. So we can't afford to cut off the grid. And our grid right now, for our basis, is tied directly to that local grid that's Power in Phoenix or Power in Tucson. So microgrids are, are somewhat of our, our answer. We've got a long ways to go. The Army's got a very aggressive plan. We're going to take all 130 major installations and have microgrids in place in the next, I think, 10 years. Uh, that's a lot. That's a lot of demands. Some of those microgrids, guess what, are going to be diesel generators. We get it, because we're not all there with solar arrays. We're not there with wind capabilities. We're not there with geothermal. Uh, we're going to put our first micro-reactor uh, up in the house, Air Force Base in Alaska. And so we're going for all comers and all capabilities to ensure that when the grid goes down, and our grids are our main grids out there across the country are really fragile, but we have the capability to continue to operate until such time as everything can happen. And we also work, work very hard on partnerships with the, uh, with the our downtown folks so that when we have excess power from our solar arrays, we can push that down to the grid there. Our challenge is, as we've talked about a couple times here already, is energy storage. You know, how, we're not there yet on how you store that so that you can get it at OPR 30 by the time you turn that generator. Uh, so we realize the importance of being part of the solution there. We realize the importance that, uh, uh, and we're going to go as far as not so much with solar power. But taking uh, our tactical vehicles and making them electric. Uh, and again, there's left and right discussions on whether that's good or bad or whether it will work or not. But the fact of the matter is, we've got a huge fleet out there, and uh, we're determined uh, to get it down to the non tactical ones uh, fully electric. And I'll go so far as to say, I just saw an article where we're going to take an Abrams tank uh, and we're going to make it a hybrid. We're going to make it partially electrical. And part of battery and partially uh, gas. For no other reason, is all our services now going, hey, if we have to fight a near term and we have to go fight China or we get uh, involved with uh, Russia there, uh, we need to be able to disperse our forces. Disperse our forces need power. How do we bring that power to them? Well, I'll tell you what, we're not going to have the luxury of just forming up the boats and moving across the Pacific or using all the capabilities that are in place in Europe. That we've got to bring our own. Power with us, so we need to be able to bring it with different means, whether it be uh, wind installations that we pack up, take with us, whether it be solar, whether it be geothermal that we have to fall in. We need to prepare ourselves to be able to not just operate from our large bases there, but to be able to disperse, deploy, and still keep ourselves capable. So it's important to us from a national security standpoint. Their problems are the ones. If we have a failure in our economic security and a failure in our that are uh, climate security there, that trickles down to a local national security. Absolutely. And, well, I'm just going to chime in. Yeah. Um, actually, had a lot of conversations, and certainly the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force have all committed to have uh, complete standalone systems for their bases, recognizing that, you know, even looking at, even though there's challenges with batteries and things, that, um, you know, one of the things, discussions that's been very much up there is that. That the troops, the majority, majority of deaths on troops is actually being on fuel transport vehicles. You know, and so it's those types of things that you realize there's some real opportunities around looking at different, really diversifying, which is a very much like, you know, this is how we do it. And so there's some real opportunities that you know get some benefits to you, but it's just being independent and security from from what some of these innovations, in hydrogen and fuel cells can do, and other solutions. This kind of goes back to the whole idea about we need to collaborate. Uh, we can't sit in our silo and do this not the Air Force Base 
we just wonder what's going on in Tucson. We need to get out of our chairs, go to our meetings, have the cross talks, look for places where we can uh, share ideas, uh, find those win win type of solutions there to get on top of this. Because, like I said, it's, it's not a spectator sport, and you'd rather not to show up to help you take care of yourself. So, I will tell you that the Public Defense has a climate action plan. Every service has a climate action plan. Every service has a facilities plan. And every one of those facility plans is looking at how do we become more resilient in order to, by trying to bend that curve, and bend that uh, upward wide slope of, uh, of temperature down. In the meantime, how do we build back better like from Hurricane Mike or to the Air Force? What structure, what standards do we need to use for our buildings? What type of uh, natural type of things we can do to protect ourselves and build our facilities? And we need to share that with our communities downtown. I guarantee you, what's going on in Davis Mountain Air Force Base, whether it's a climate event, uh, whether it's rain, wind, or, or whatever, it's probably impacted to some of them. I, uh, I, I wanted to sort of, uh, to discuss the idea that um, the military has to be involved um, and sort of, you know, can't just, you know, sit on your hands, you know, wherever you're at. Um, and I want to sort of talk about the importance of public-private community partnerships in that role and that not only politically, like, where you're engaging and, and you know, trying to, to sort of build those relationships, um, you know, that, that sort of help to sort of optimize your operations, but also maybe technologically, if there's any sort of adva advances that you see through grant programs, um, you know, through DOD or, or you know, um, Mark or Otto as well, like if you experience public-private partnerships, you know, in your day-to-day -day that are really essential, because I think, you know, all of us up here agree that it is sort of, it's an everybody issue that this sort of transition, you know, needs, needs sort of a whole of nation cooperation to use your words. Um, so, just speaking to the importance of it. I'm going to mark through the details, but the military side is very important to us. And yes, we need to do due diligence. We want to make sure that what we sign up to is what, it's going to work for both sides of the, of the, of the coin there, so to speak. But they are important to us. And they're, they're forceful by a good sense uh, because of what we bring to the table as far as different perspectives, different cultures, different backgrounds, different ideas. We need to bring them all to the table, pick best of breed, and go ahead and move forward with those uh, public partnerships out there, public partnerships. That again gives us that force multiplication as we're working through mitigation, trying to transition to clean energy, again, to cut down on our uh, greenhouse gas emissions out there. Yeah, I think Harry, one of the things and opportunities you recognize, Harry Bloom's very, another instance actually, that as they build these microgrids and as they have them, they don't actually need to operate on them at the time. They can actually use grid power and let some of that renewable power be used for other things at the time. So actually, in an emergency, yeah, so it's, it's shut off, but at least being able to share some of those resources. And even as you mentioned, Tucson being able to sell some of that power to them, then when you do need it, you can always call on it. And so building microgrids can be used for multiple, both, you know, defense and, and public purposes and then buffering the area and dividing the benefits across the site can really make it much more economic rather than say we've got this here, we can't really use it most of the time, like it being able to use it to make more data uh, for all uses and partnering utilities to use it in for peak times <laughs> and uh, to help with the peak load and then by the end of the load to see if people have comments. I'll be the last to say that well, the first is to say that the military has all the answers, but we do have an extensive research and development type of funding out there that uh, they bring good ideas, they work through in there, do some experimentations, beta testing, share with the community, go forward, see if it's scalable. There'll be winners and losers there. But, uh, there's great potential out there uh, as far as uh, to get more and more serious about working through the mitigation of the transition to the clean energy. See that in the dollars that are spent within the Department of Defense and the services there that are shared to the communities. Uh, things that have been there at headquarters, the Air Force, or all the other services trickle down to the base very quickly. Uh, and we'd be foolish not to take those down downtown and say, hey, I think I've got a good idea here that might uh, benefit the residency of Phoenix or Tucson. We have the Navy and uh, has all the expertise. Submarines, so 
I, I'm really kind of, it's going to, they're certainly saying it's going to take a long time, but I, I really, that to me would be a home run. <laughs> I'm actually get my career clear to work uh, in a, you know, I mean, you know, I think half the side of this table here could be running this building 24-7. Uh, uh, so, you know, it'd be really interesting opportunities around that. So, I can put the point in there from an uh, environment company. Yeah, there's certainly contamination issues with things to deal with, but still, um, from it's, um, um, it's great, yeah, but from just from a straight carbon emissions, um, you know, dealing with you know, immediate issues around carbon emissions, it certainly is, has a great potential. Now, one of us talk about carbon emissions. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I represent industry, so we obviously are very supportive of public private partnerships. We would like to build, install, finance uh, all of these kinds of projects. Including microgrids, um, it's competitive industry, so that's certainly something that's really important to us, and, and would like to be at the table, you know, whatever possible. Yeah, involved with another nonprofit whose uh, logo is strictly environment proof for the uh, economy, and that's exactly what we're trying to find in the partnership with the table. And, you know, so we don't want to oversell it, but at the same time, uh, it's got great potential to know that you know, move out more quickly than what we are uh, as far as uh, uh, mitigating the uh, effects of climate change. Yeah, um, something that you had touched on a little bit ago, Mark, that I, I wanted to like circle back to was um, talking about sort of buildings um, and, and sort of their sustainability as, as their own sort of standalone unit, but also maybe um, like spatial, spatially, you know, like um, the way that our cities are built and are organized and um, I, Thinking about you know Phoenix's tendency to to, to build out you know um, and, and create creates more opportunity for solar and less shade, but I guess I just I want to I wanted your opinion on like the trade offs um, you know in in, this, in the field of sustainability with um, like maybe the the way that you know you build buildings up and, and you're shading solar panels makes it less effective, but it's it's a little bit more dense so. I guess I just I wanted sort of a, a look into those trade offs um, that, that maybe you have to be looking at role um, in how you how you sort of think about those. Uh, there's an article in the Onion a couple a couple years ago where it's actually it was focusing on a study where they looked at the northern border of Phoenix, which is the south of Chicago, on um, the, the southern mm -hmm. border would be going down into the northern tier of uh, South America. So, uh, you know, we'd be in the suburbs, but actually, it's somewhat of a just a spook, but, you know, in Phoenix, you know, our south spent 95% of our building is all infill. Like, we're all infill here. Our borders are limited, and we're, we're infill development. It's actually the most economic as well. Initially, with, so a lot of it, some of it is the uh, bedroom communities on the outside can grow a little on the outsides, but for Phoenix itself, um, it's very much infill, and it is very much transitioning to, from a single family, to multi-family buildings and increasing density for the services you can provide. So that's that's really how our growth is accommodated. And you know, just the efficiency of you know what a you know an acre of farmland uh, uses ten times more water than a, a acre of homes. So you know, it's just looking at different different ways and where are you using your water and how it's using. Farming was very important. I'm not suggesting that that's uh, you know the duty to eat. Uh, so, um, but just thinking about how you're allocating your resources and when you're using them. But I think from from a society, I think hey, we're growing, we're using all these resources. We're the fastest growing city in the U.S. Like from the large cities. Um, yet, with all of our waste, we just do things more efficiently. We just lots of surplus. It's just crazy how much. Energy and food waste and all these things. If we actually build our system to actually be not so wasteful, we could more than accommodate growth uh, just from that. From that um, I think I think that that's that's huge. Sort of that push pull between you know conservation and also like sustainability as we push forward and create new things, but but then also you know picking up sort of the, the back end, the flip side of that conversation. Is, it's sort of the waste, you know, once you're once you're using those, those sustainable systems. Um, I, I autumn to, to sort of return to sort of that, that private public sort of relationship. Um, you you've been really present in the solar energy space for 
for a, a long time now, and it's, I mean, like less than two years. <laughs> for sure, it's a long time. It in, feels like a long time. In your in your role, I mean, I I just I would imagine that you know there there are um, a lot of like great sort of lessons in like climate and sort of energy resilience, and I was I was sort of wondering um, like what is um, like, I guess, from a policy perspective, you had mentioned that that states and, and localities are getting um, you receive pushback, um, but like, which is maybe one state understand. in particular. Yeah. <laughs> right. that's, a, that's a nice word for it. Yes, but, a lot of headwinds. Yeah, yeah. I guess you know, can we can we talk sort of specifics of like sort of policies? Policy obstacles that, that sort of actively sort of push against, you know, creating that um, that widespread use that I, mean, I think maybe folks in Washington we should, we should achieve just for our reputation. We don't we don't have enough time to go through all the obstacles. <laughs> uh, I'm just before I I'm kind of joking, but just I'll, I'll touch on Mark's point really quick because um, I did run the questions by a lot of my. My industry folks, and they wanted me to just harp on the importance of uh, updating building codes <laughs> to be more friendly uh, for quick adoption or quicker adoption, and even things like parking structures, you know, being covered with solar. The height of those structures really makes a big difference, and trucks backing into them, and those kinds of things. And so, there's a lot of little things that could be done on the building code side of things, and then things like as far as installing the solar more quickly, Phoenix's. Um, experimenting with something called Solar App, which is a faster permitting process for distributed solar, but that has limitations as far as you, you know, if you're going to do batteries or you're going, you need a panel upgrade. Those kinds of things create complications, and you see a lot of differences between the different cities uh, for how quickly those things can be can be approved. And so, those are all little things I think that factor into the clean energy transition, as well as obvious energy efficiency. On your more recent question, uh, I mean, so I kind of joke, but I'm not really joking, that I would say almost every sector for solar right now has issues with the exception of the off-grid folks. The off-grid folks are the only people who don't call me to complain about something on almost a daily basis. Every other scale of solar, and we do have wind members also, and storage, and we do electrification as well, um, have, have some obstacles. You would think, I'll start with electrification really quickly, you would think that in a city, that's seen so many announcements for uh, electrification of transportation and battery manufacturing. We would be a little more excited and a little more supportive of electrification policies, but what you see the Corporation Commission and the legislature right now are, I would say, highly anti-EV sort of policies, highly anti-EV rhetoric. Um, we just had Tucson Electric Power, um, the Corporation Commission just eliminated all their EV charging rate plans <laughs> in their last rate case. Um, you know, with the whole point, talking about grid resiliency and those kinds of things, you know, manage charging of when people are charging our electric vehicle is super important for the grid. And I think it's really short-sighted to be eliminating programs that incentivize uh, charging at times of day that are off peak, um, specific to EVs. And so you see little things like that. I know the legislature loves big the things. big things. And the legislature loves to try to do anti-EV bills. Um, pretty concerned with, you know, some possible, um, Punitive measures that try to alleviate the gas tax issue, but might just actually make it less economic to have electric vehicles um, next legislative session. So there's things like that. Uh, electrification of uh, homes is really challenging. They passed a gas ban ban in 2020, which prohibited cities um, from restricting uh, gas, uh, new gas installations, and they 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 tried to do to to make to go farther with that uh, this session. I did die in session. We do have a you know potential veto on some of these anti clean energy transition bills now, which is a you know a little bit of a comfort because uh, that hadn't been the case for the last several years. On the solar side of things, um, you know, it's it's interesting because I think that you see a lot of sort of anti-distributed, i.e. rooftop solar kind of rhetoric from the state level as well as our major utilities. And then you kind of see the inverse. We are seeing a lot of cities and counties now trying to enact restrictions or moratoriums on utility scale renewables. And it's a little bit of a catch 22 because the local governments will say, we don't want your utility scale projects here. A rooftop is fine. And then the state will say, you should, rooftop or a rooftop's not economic enough. You should just build.
build more utility skills, but you're making them less economic to be a rooftop. So you're going to catch 22. You can't build utility scale projects because you've got city and county restrictions. And then you can't build it distributed because the economics don't pencil out because of high interest rates and low export rates from the corporation commission. And so you end up in a situation in which you really can't build either kind of thing at a time when we're seeing massive load growth. Uh, APNS has just said recently that by 2031, they're looking at 40% increase in peak and a 60% increase in demand by 2031. Uh, we need to build a lot of stuff and we need to build it quickly and obstacles. You know, increase obstacles at the state or local level, make it less likely that we're going to keep the lights on and transition away from, from resources that continue to just make it hotter and hotter and hotter, which requires more and more electricity. So uh, it's not to be, not to be too apocalyptic. We head back to my get together comment, but most of my days uh, right now are dealing with, um, with impediments uh, to, to increase adoption. I mean, to, to rephrase and like, yeah, it's like a twilight zone where, where there's a lot of incentives. There's incentives at the federal level, there are impediments on the state and local level that prevent you from doing anything, and then also a push pull, a sub conversation within that where it's utility versus like rooftop and, and sort of the the larger sort of policy arguments for each. It just, well, you know, yeah. there was an article out just yesterday that I was looking at that Arizona is the fourth largest recipient of IRA dollars from manufacturing, right? We're looking at $7 billion of investment in Arizona. It's the fourth state in the country for investment. And yet you see policymakers constantly, you know, bashing the IRA and saying it was a mistake and they want to repeal it and do all of these things. I'm also on a bunch of calls with national folks, you know, trying to fight off, you know, repeal of the IRA, which is not something I really want to be spending my time on, but is discussions that are going on in D.C. And so uh, it's, uh, it is a little bit strange that you'd be looking at $7 billion of investment in your state at the same time, you know, speaking out against that investment. It's, it's, it's a little bit of a head scratch. I think there were, not a rebuttal. No, it's not a rebuttal at all. It's actually- Bring it on, Mark. I'm ready for the debate. So, Let's go. No, it's, well, for me, like, I mean, certainly if you're, if you're in the legislature, you hear the rhetoric, it's absolutely, so yeah, I don't listen to that rhetoric at all. So uh, you know, so your your part of your job is actually be there lobbying for that. And so for me, it's like very, it's like you know, I am gonna talk on the things that are getting traction, like putting putting my money in the horses that are winners and focusing on those. And and even within city government, uh, you know, even this resistance. And so I'm very much like, okay, well, what can we do and how? If we can do it, how do we do it? And focusing on, and I think that. That ultimately, you know, there's so um, it doesn't matter what it is that uh, you know. Generally, our society has moved to a banana philosophy. You know, you know a banana philosophy. Well, that's absolutely nothing anywhere near anyone. Yeah. So, um, the, you know, that people are generally resistant, but actually, we do need to have that conversation of what is what is it? What, what do we want our cities to be? What do we want them to be? Years from now, would you like? Would you want? Are you? We're all for clean air. Yeah, we're all for long-term water supply. We're all for. And looking at that, it's interesting. When they did a study in Sweden, they actually said we want to build. As a society, we need other resources that we want to build a nuclear plant. We're wanting to have it. Would you be willing to consider it for your community to sort of help save? You know, and um, sixty-five percent said yes. Are you willing to do that? And but the other half, they surveyed because they're really wanting to see a pathway. And they actually said, would you be willing to um, build, do the same message, all the same first paragraph, the same second paragraph said, and if it is in your community, we will actually pay you a thousand dollars a year uh, as part of because you're willing to have this in your community. Twenty-four percent accepted it because it's, if it was all of a sudden you're being paid for it for your sin taking this or something, people are not supportive, but it was actually just position that you're actually being there to do. And so I think of that dialogue of what is the society we're wanting and really having that to to appeal to, to not rob people of the wanting to do the right thing because you know I think population wise most people say no I'm not willing to do <laughs> you know so and uh, and uh, even if 
they're not as open, they're supposed to want to be open, and so, so, uh, <laughs> so I think that really, we really need to focus on those, what, what can we do, and I think we still need to lobby uh, to get those uh, regulations in too, and we still need to fight for the building code, which, I'm not worried about my job security, no, so, yeah, so, um, so the real thing, and I think, yeah, I certainly, I think the building code, and working right on that, but it still is, yeah, we definitely need to move and get people to start seeing it, because it's, Things like, yeah, no, I don't, don't, don't like canals, and then they go to Scottsdale and they're like, oh, this is really nice here. Like, you know, so, yeah, I'd be okay with this in my neighborhood, just not my canal, you know. And so, you really have to get people to see a vision of what it is, and then they're um, they're much more open. Um, even shut closing streets and making them walkable in business sectors. That doesn't matter where you are in the world, all around the world, every business stands up, protests, and you just completely anger, saying, you can't close our street and start business, it's a livelihood, and they make it a walkable plaza, and everybody comes and everybody goes, this is the best thing you've ever done. <laughs> you know what happens in cities, as we're talking to cities around the globe, the same thing, and if you try to, in certain people are say, hey, I'm just going to this pedestrian bike only, and just for the, all the businesses here, people close it like crazy, and we probably get a, a little legislature saying, no city is allowed to close the street that a business is on, you know. Yet, um, yet it's really, so you do have to let people see it, and uh, they're much more positive. Okay, this, is such, this is a little bit off of what Mark was saying, but back on the NIMBYism, when you think of kind of where you started on the Not My Backyard sort of idea, I just, I think there's just, the NIMBY is an issue, I think, is a threat to security, I think it's a threat to reliability, I also think it's a threat to, to reduced carbon emissions over time. Everybody wants to use electricity, and nobody wants it to be near them or to have to see anything. I listen to so many public comment sessions on the Line Siding Committee, which, which is a subset of the Corporation Commission, um, as well as public comment of the Corporation Commission on a lot of these issues and at the legislature. Um, you know, I, I, I was just talking to somebody uh, somebody this morning about it, and I think that what it really comes down to is, you know, kind of where your priorities lie. Everyone is going to have to be impacted as we build out the grid to transition from fossil fuels to energy, and we're all going to be seeing the infrastructure that's required to do it. And I, I think of this really important thing that I heard someone from the Audubon Society say, because part of your question is also about impediments to transmission build out, I think, which is really... Um, significant issue of uh, just the policy hurdles with, with transmission and how many different you know government agencies and, and bodies are involved from federal to state. But you know the Audubon when Sunzia was a, a fight that we were having here twice over the course of like 10 or 15 years, you know, the Audubon Society was like, you know what's bad for birds? Climate change. Um, and I think about that all the time, right? Um Sunzia is a wind transmission line for folks that don't know and there's you know you see even even in Mojave County, we're not talking about how wind turbines kill birds, you know, house cats kill way more birds than wind turbines. Nobody seems to want to talk about that. Anyway, my point is just that everyone is going to be impacted. If you are the kind of person that says, I'm pro renewables, just not by me, then you are not pro renewables. Like, we're, we are all going to have to have renewables by us somewhere, everywhere, if we're going to actually transition to keep the lights on. Well said. No, I think that that's a fantastic place for, for me to sort of end my questions. And, and if anybody in the audience has some questions as well, I have, yeah, we've got about five, ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but let someone else ask first because my home is in Joe Murphy Ventures in there. That's my job. So. <laughs> oh, that's a question. Uh, so, you're talking a lot about renewables and EVs and things like that, and, and the NIMBY theme. I, I'm curious where you stand or if you get involved with mining, you know, because I mean, it's, not, it's not grown, it's mined, right? And so Arizona has an awful lot of, of untapped minerals, and there's a lot of jazz in the market, but that's where I'm gonna try to get some into the mine. Um, and critical minerals are a big, a big part of going green. City of Phoenix, solar energy, or you weighing in for a and understand you want your your ranch or your whatever not to ever see a uh, mining truck go by that could be weighing in on that side of it for a year or something. Well, I mean, I think some of the opposition is yeah, let's open up the Grand Canyon and start mining there. You know, I think that is a different thing to go You and I think also. 
you know, I think that part of it is of the mining issue is that it's cheaper to mine than to do other things in, in sort of from an individual's company's perspective. So uh, if you look at gold out of a mine, it's three hundred dollars an ounce. The cost to actually pull it out of the ground. Um, circuit board is worth forty five hundred dollars an ounce. It's already at so really designing for our we're we're designing everything to be disposable. And so really thinking about so I'm just tempering this idea of mining to say, oh it's the cheapest way, it's just dig holes everywhere. Yeah well maybe I don't know how you know the strategy that's like really should we design things for reuse. Like even even books, like why don't they come out of polymers and infinite recyclable that you can just keep you know, done with the book, just take another book out of it. Like you know when there's no uh, you can infinitely recycle um, books. And so really designing the lithium you can get almost all of it out of here. That with the mining gates, so we need to advance technology and recycling, pulling that lithium back up again. But some of that is just design, even buildings designing for deconstruction, um, rather than just continually looking for sources. So I, I, that's my main concern with mining is just we want to you know take it out of the mine, build things with it, and put it in a landfill, which is build it, fill, fill the hole, maybe you put it back in the mine. Store it there. <laughs> but you know, it's, it is really just that whole propensity, just single use stuff. Instead of let's design a whole society where it's a circular economy, and then you don't really have that same dependence on money. So that'd be my main thing about it. Yes, you need to have, you have the resources, but just I would say I really want to think about how we're designing our system and not just to look at most first cost without long term. I, I kind of want to add on to what Mark says because I do a lot of reporting on tribes and mines and, and sacred sites and, and impacts. And one thing that, that the tribes and rural people both want is when, when a resource extraction company is thinking about doing something, um, it costs millions and millions of dollars to develop these plants. And then they go present them to, to the rural community or the tribe and say, what do you think? What they want is, before you even, even start, you know, putting pen and paper, you know, because I'm an old lady and it's still pen and paper instead of, you know, electronic pen and screen, go to the communities that you think are going to be impacted and say, this is, this is what's laying under the ground is there a way that we can work together to get this out of the ground that's not going to ruin your sacred site, that's not going to impact the riparian zone, you know, have very many of that, that is not going to um, put lots and lots of toxic waste into the water system. I mean, there's ways to do this. And if anyone's here from a mine that's doing that, I, I want to hear about it because I want to write some more solutions Doing this, I'd rather see people doing this, and that's my bias is solutions journalism. But that, that's my thing, guys. So, if anyone has any, any ideas? I've talked, talked to these nice to get men from free for it. Um, you know, they say, and this is the thing is that, is that the mining companies are saying, We have learned our lesson and we want to do it better. Um, so, if anyone is already doing it better, give me a call because I'm not going to. Yeah, I guess I would just add, you know, uh, I think the mining conversation is really important. That's a great question. You know, to your point, I did check with the utilities. With, <laughs> they, don't, they don't source any of their uranium from the Grand Canyon or even domestically. It actually costs way more to use domestic uranium than, than international uranium. But I, I think it's a really nuanced conversation. It's really important. You know, Autumn as an individual is not excited about mining. Autumn as an energy professional realizes that there is literally no electricity generating source that does not require extractive industries. There's just none. They all require extracting something. Whether you're digging the fossil fuels out of the ground, you're digging up coal, whether you're digging up, you know, the, the rare earth minerals for batteries, um, those kinds of things, they're all involved. I agree with Mark's comment about the circular economy. I also think it's important, though, to, to be thinking about things kind of in broader context. What makes me really nervous is when members of the legislature decide that they're really, really concerned about panel recycling, but don't care about recycling and any kind of fossil fuel um, technologies. And so I just think that everything kind of needs to be on the same footing. I don't like when you start um, 
you know, punishing solar or storage for uh, you know, issues that have been a problem for hundreds of years in the older technology. Okay, I have another question. <laughs> um, storage, you know, we're talking about lithium and all of that. I, a few years ago, I talked with a, a startup that was looking into a radical new way of storage, flywheels. Has anyone heard anything about you know, is flywheel technology progressing? Is it actually going to become economically viable? But what they were telling me is that is that they can build it. You know, obviously there's going to be some engineering issues. But the concept is that you can you know, going back to what Mark said about recycling, you can use recycled metals and, and build these these flywheels, which of course spin up Kind of like the pump storage, only mechanical. You, you, you pump them up during the day, and then during the night, you unspool them to get the electricity out. So, is anybody and, and any other kind of alternatives to, you know, like sodium batteries, iron batteries, any other types of batteries that that, that are on the horizon? I would say that energy storage is. Probably one of the number one research things right now. It's just such a huge need uh, in the market, um, and on, on many types of batteries and solutions. And flywheels have been around since the nineties uh, and have been, and are still they're still they're still employing new new solutions and better ones, better better and faster. And, uh, um, but but I mean I think all the technology areas. But I think uh, I'm actually hopeful. Uh, uh, of, I would say that technology is about energy storage just because there's so much value in it to, to anyone who does have a solution. So it's well funded. Uh, the actual batteries are very expensive. So when you have good funding available for new solutions, I think it's, that's where, you know, one thing that, um, you know, I think humans, the best thing to have is actually innovation. You know, that uh, when there's a and there's a, a need, and you're actually forced to say that generally we're like, don't want to use our brains. And so we, just, we, don't, we don't want to use our brains. It's like, oh, you can't do it. No, you had to do it. You can't do it. There's no way. If you had to do it, how would you do it? Well, how would you do it? You know, and then people get intrigued like the puzzle. And so I think a lot of the technologies were going that way after we get over initial laziness. There's some really great innovation that can happen. And um, I think that as we, uh, and the US is particularly good at that. China's horrible at it, trying to create a replicating. So I think some of those innovations are really going to come out of the US and some more countries that are actually really encouraging a society that really rewards innovation. That's where that innovation is going to come from. And you, I want to follow up with me afterwards, too. Yeah. We, we don't have any members that are doing long duration energy storage right now, but um, I have been in touch with the Long Duration Energy Storage uh, Council in California and have provided some of those resources to the legislature. And we have a conference on the 6th of November, and we have a panel that's kind of on, uh, it's not just on storage, but it's on kind of um, market developments and new technology, and we're going to be talking about hydrogen and long duration energy storage, and we do have a speaker on that topic. So follow up with me. I'd be happy to happy to connect you. On that note, I think that's a perfect way to close. Thank you for your questions, and, and thank you for being willing to participate in this. Awesome. <laughs> no, she's four weeks old. <laughs> I, she did go to the corporation commission for a full day when she was nine days old. She's a trooper. Thank you all for it. Uh, she's a little solar baby. She is cute. She is cute. No offense, guys. Hi. Oh, hey. Yes.